In conjunction with the 50th year anniversary of the Title IX legislation, welcome to North Florida Athletics' Talking Title IX series, where we interview current and former UNF student athletes and staff on the influence of college athletics in their lives and the ongoing impact made by Title IX. Enjoy. Welcome back to our next edition of Talking Title IX with Donna Kirk. Uh, great to have you on to our fourth episode. Uh, before we get going here, just give a quick introduction of yourself and what your title is at North Florida. Sure. Um, so my name is Donna Kirk. I'm the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Compliance and Administration. Um, I've been at UNF about nine years, um, or this is the end of my ninth year. And um, yeah, so I uh, actually uh, was born in a little, small little Navy base in Rhode Island uh, called Quonset Point. And at some point they uh, closed the base and my dad was transferred down here to Jacksonville that had three active Navy bases at the time. Uh, and uh, luckily he, through his Naval career, was just transferred from base to base in here in the Jacksonville area. So uh, I was able to not, I guess, move like most military uh, kids and uh, was able to, um, you know, spend my childhood here. Uh, so I attended Middleburg, Middleburg High School and uh, then went on to Florida State University and uh, did then went on to a master's program at uh, Georgia Southern and uh, earned a degree there. So that's kind of my educational history, uh, you know, uh, my, my background to date. So Yeah, I knew you had that military background in your family. I didn't really necessarily ask that in the questions, but did that kind of inform how you went about your career at all, or do you feel like it structured you in a way um, through your career, having that family in the, mil in the military? Yes, actually, um, we did have quite a bit of structure. I was one of four kids, and uh, two of my siblings actually went into the military as well. Uh, my sister went to the Air Force, and my brother um, went into um, like naval um, submarine training, um, nuclear power school. Uh, and uh, went into the reser reserves after that. Um, but it, yeah, it was always kind of in, in a sense that I think that, um, you know, even the, the bit of uh, athletics background that I had and that I participated in, you, you did feel that, that structure, that um, discipline, that, um, you know, and, and my skill set for, you know, what I bring uh, as far as, you know, in my career, that attention to detail, that, you know, organization. Uh, so, it, yeah, I did, did kind of tend uh, to uh, come from that, that military structure, I think. Sure. Um, so growing up, you talked about it a little bit, but did, was it your intention to go into athletics? Did you have kind of a clear set path that you wanted to pursue growing up in high school and then when you started in college? No, actually... Um, I distinctly remember in eighth grade, you know, everybody had to stand up. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember my response was a mom. You know, so that was my like my first instinct of I really want to be a parent. I want to have uh, some children, which um, I think, you know, for young girls is kind of uh, a norm. Um, but my dad, uh, he was a superstar athlete. So when he was in high school, uh, he was the fastest runner, the best athlete on the basketball team, baseball star. So when in our house, we had this four foot huge trophy. It was taller than me at some points um, of his all around, you know, best athlete and, you know, class of 1962 in Coventry High School. Um, but he, and then after high school, he joined the Navy and was on the softball team. He was on a bowling league. He threw horseshoes. I mean, anything and everything that he tried, he was really good at. Even now, he's an avid tennis player. Uh, so uh, uh, I just always gravitated towards sports and athletics because my dad and I had two older brothers um, that were also um, either running or playing tennis or, or uh, doing some type of sport. So I, I did as well. So actually my, my mom put me in dance, uh, ballet, tap, and jazz when I was four. And then when I got, I did the all the way up into high school. And then I broke my mom's heart when I said, I don't want to dance anymore. I want to try out for the basketball team, <laughs> which, you know, I was terrible, but I, I uh, really enjoyed my experience. But um, I really excelled more in cross country and track. Um, 
I was the, according to my cross country coach at Middleburg High School, the first female athlete to break six minutes for a mile. And uh, so my trajectory was really great. And I, I uh, but I developed some kind of heart ailment that was never really diagnosed, but I got, got to the point where I couldn't even finish a cross country race. Like my, um, I, I don't know what was going on. I couldn't either get enough breath or it was just my heart was beating on my chest, but they never could really figure out what it was. But um, I went from, you know, wow, I mean, the sky's the limit to just, I couldn't do anything. So I ended up joining the dance team at high school and doing a little thing, you know, something less exertive. But I think that really probably did trigger my thought of, I want to go into athletics because I can't do it for myself, but I want to live vicariously through student athletes that can. And so I think that that did draw me to, toward it because I couldn't pursue it for myself. And uh, even though I've had a lot of potential, I felt. And so, uh, yeah, it did drive me in that sense. Yeah, so you go start, as you start with your bachelor's. What was um, your first kind of exposure to working in college athletics at that point? What did it happen at? You know, Florida State? Absolutely. So I went to Florida State and I did look for some type of uh, degree program in, in sports. So back in the 1980s, there was no sport management um, that didn't exist. So the only uh, degree program that involved sports at all at FSU at the time was a degree in the College of Communications. It was sports information management and marketing was the concentration in the uh, communication school. So that's what I pursued. And so at the time I was like, oh, I'll go into sports broadcasting. I'm gonna be a sportscaster, I'm gonna be on the news, you know, uh, bringing you know, news to, to, in, to homes uh, in Jacksonville or wherever. And uh, so I pursued that and um, was involved in uh, broadcasting at FSU. So uh, I was on this program called Seminole Uprising. So it was, you know, the, the local uh, cable markets um, there. I think it was like the old Sunshine Sports Network. That is where it aired. Um, but I did, um, I learned how to edit. Um, I did my own um you know, stand-up shots and whatnot, and uh, did, uh, I remember I did a, a, a piece on um, Say No to Drugs, so back in the 80s, that was a huge was thing, great, it was a big, big thing, yeah. yeah, so the, um, so the FSU football uh, players that would go and talk um, in uh, the local high schools or middle schools, and so I did kind of a piece on that, and then I did one on like the recruiting class. I'll never forget that recruiting class at the time included, included Warwick Dunn. And um, just seeing, uh, you know, the, the uh, clips of his high school um, film was like ridiculous. I mean, he would just kind of squirt out of a hole if they couldn't tackle him. It was, it, it was, it was great. So. Uh, just, you know, those types of things I, and I pieced together and I was, um, you know, doing broadcasting, thinking that's what I was, would do. And uh, in 1992, that summer, I did a, an internship with Dan Hicken, actually here, he was at Channel 12 at the time. And uh, that experience was great. I had a wonderful time. I, it was Jeff Prosser at the time and Dan Hicken. They were both in TV. And my experience in the in the sports realm was great. Um, my exposure to just kind of how TV uh, news works, I was like, oh my gosh, this is really cutthroat. It was like backstabbing, you know. That's kind of what the vibe I got. Not in the sports department, but just in the the bigger realm of it. And uh, and then besides the fact that when I really got a chance to you know practice or get on camera, I'm like oh my gosh, I look like I'm 12. <laughs> I just look so young. It's like, I just, I don't think this is really for me. And um, so that's what that internship really kind of, kind of pointed me to. Even though I, I did get great exposure at FSU and that internship was like, this isn't it for me. It just wasn't really clicking or resonating for me. So I went back to FSU for my senior year and talked to an upper administrator um, in the athletics department. He had just come back from a sport management um, uh, conference at Georgia Southern. And so Georgia Southern was one of the first schools in the country that offered a master's program in sport management. 
and he said, you really should look into that program. They're offering graduate assistantships, uh, and you can get basically your tuition for free if you teach some, you know, um, elective PE type courses, and um, you can get your degree, your master's degree in sport management. So I did. I looked into that, and I got the assistantship, and I taught fitness walking, jogging, and bowling. <laughs> or the Box, yeah. PE, yeah, yeah, so one credit, you know, elective classes. So I was a grad assistant, taught and um, earned my master's in sport management at Georgia Southern. Interesting. So what was that transition period like for you? Was it difficult to kind of change gears like that? Or, you know, how did that go for you? Um, no, nah, I, um, I think the the decision to go to grad school kind of, I felt to me, bought me some more time mm -hmm. to kind of figure out what direction I wanted to go. Um, and at the time, it, it's ironic because one of the classes that I took in 1994, um, the AD at Georgia Southern taught the class and our textbook was the 1994 um, or 93-94 um, NCA manual. And at the time, you know, I didn't know that that would be my career, you know, going forward. But um, it was, you know, really did open my eyes to, you know, recruiting and extra benefits and just how boosters fit into that and just his perspective from an athletic director and, um, you know, and just how the inner workings of athletics departments work within the context of an NCA manual and doing things the right way and within the regulations that are, you know, put in place. So that really did open my eyes and never really um, delve into that um, in that way. So um, didn't know at that time that that's where I'd end up, but it, it definitely, um, you know, gave me some good context for what was to come. Yes, yeah, so and you got that context for what you might want to do and saw that side of things. How did you go about, you know, pursuing jobs? Like today, obviously, you know, I know you deal with it every day and everybody else to some degree that's hiring. You have the job websites, you have social media to post things, but that really was an option in the 90s. Right. So how did you go about pursuing jobs? So Georgia Southern's master's program offered two, two branches. So you could either do the dissertation if you were wanting to go on to get a PhD, or you could do more of a practicum, which was an internship um, and the same degree, but just kind of a different um, second year. And so I decided to do the practicum and the internship. and. Um, I will remember I was in my apartment at, um, in Statesboro when uh, the NFL announced that the, uh, they were expanding their, their franchises and Jacksonville's getting a franchise. So I actually applied for an internship with the Jacksonville Jaguars and got it um, and worked in their ticket office as an intern. And uh, so that was my first exposure to professional sports. Um, and I did that for a year. And uh, it was, it was d interesting in the sense that, yes, I was in the ticket office, but mainly I was just processing orders because the tickets were selling themselves. Everybody was ecstatic that the city was getting a franchise. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, everybody was lining up to get tickets. It was not like a marketing <laughs> kind of a deal. Yeah. It was selling sure itself. Um, so I did that, and uh, it was interesting because at the time, they were also completely renovating uh, the stadium. So the, uh, the Jaguars office was this, you know, bay of, um, uh, like, portables or uh, trailers. Mo yes, mobile homes. And so our ticket office was in this, and you'd walk down to go to the bathroom or... Uh, down to the little kitchenette area, and you'd see there's Tom Coughlin, you know, pouring his coffee, and you know, good morning. I mean, everybody was kind of together, and uh, so it was it was a really neat experience. We played in the Hall of Fame game that year, and um, and whatnot. But uh, that, you know, it ended up really not being for me either. That professional sports um, uh, environment. Uh, so. 
I had an opportunity to apply for a position at Jacksonville University and they were looking for a new ticket manager. So I applied um, for that and uh, at the time, Barry Mil Milligan, Barry Milligan was the um, director of marketing and he hired me uh, to be Jacksonville University's ticket manager. And then I spent three uh, years in that position um, before I transitioned to compliance and kind of a little story there too. Yeah, well that's, <laughs> you know, yeah, obviously that kickstarted what you're doing here at North Florida. Um, that provides good context for me. Was it, was there any difficulty kind of getting your footing and figuring out, obviously the Jags thing kind of landed in your lap at the time as a native, you know, but was, were there any challenges or times of doubt at all getting into it? Sure. I mean, so back in, so at this point in time, this was the late 90s. Um, I, I mean, there were still, we were still connecting to the internet via dial-up, yeah. you know, and so there was no ticketing programs. It was literally, I was, you know, typing up invoices on like what, carbon? Scantron yes, like right. Yeah. Um, invoices for tickets and sending out to it. So it was very manual. It yeah. was um, not anything like compared to what we do today where everything's so automated. Um, but it was, I think, more just relationship driven. Well, and it is relationship driven now too, but, um, you know, with with uh, season ticket holders and, and um, that. But I what was interesting, what was going on at the time in the late 90s at Jacksonville University is that um, they were running into a major infractions case. And um, that was you know, separate than from the ticket office, but you couldn't help know what was going on. And so there was like major allegations and then a major investigation. And um, Jacksonville University, it was, there were major violations with um, the men's soccer program. So the men's soccer coach was fired, the athletic director was let go, and the president was um, dismissed. It was severe involving boosters and infiltration into the program. And uh, it, it uh, rendered five years of probation for the program and so at the time, like I said, I was in the ticket office, but the compliance office was next door to me. And so I was really kind of just interested in the summers when I had a little bit of downtime, you know, what do you do, kind of learning what their processes were or whatnot. And um, so I got an opportunity to go to an NCA regional rules seminar. It was in Orlando that particular summer. And, um, and the, the compliance director had already left Penny, Penny Brown, um, who's now Penny Parker. She's the athletic director at Rollins now. Um, but she had left to go to Florida State um, uh, as a compliance administrator. And uh, then Eric Baumgartner was the GA at the time and um, told me on the way back from the regional rules seminar that he's taking a job at Clemson. So that compliance office was going to be vacant. Mm -hmm. And so, like I told you, the athletic director got fired. And so they um, transitioned the AD position, uh, became our, was our head basketball coach. So our head men's basketball coach became the athletic director in that transition. And it's a lot. And so he was kind of doing a restructuring of the offices. And so he was meeting with each of us individually. And he said, um, I really see you, you know, moving into like a, a marketing director, you know, into more marketing game day promotions, whatnot. And I told him, I really want the compliance job. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it just really um, kind of took him aback. And, 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 you know, if you think about it, here's a program that's facing five years of probation and, you know, would you take a chance on somebody that has never even done that job full time? Um, looking back on it, I never, ever should have had that job, I don't think. But I really just went for it. You know, I just really said, um, I, 
I really think I can do it and I want to do a good job for you and I want to protect, you know, the, the department and the university. And um, he thought about it. He consulted with the conference office. The conference office told him no way. But he went out on a limb for me and, you know, uh, just really put all of his confidence in me. And it was baptism by fire. And I got through five years of probation. And, you know, I was there a total of 16 years and 13 of it was in compliance. So I'm um, really kind of uh, the, the phoenix arose, I guess, from the, the ashes there. Um, but really, you know, did quite a bit to, to build the compliance program there. And then, you know, during that 10 year APR started up and, you know, I did that since inception and followed those retention and eligibility and graduation rates and things. And so it, it was really, you know, um, I think just, um, I don't have a confidence in myself, even though I didn't really have a, you don't know what you're getting into, but you just know. It's like I know that I'm detail oriented. I know that I'm so I'm organized. I know that I have the skill set to do this job. I just needed to, you know, learn the lingo and 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 really just kind of work to build the processes and and build those campus partnerships on campus. Yeah, it's the foundational pieces that you kind of kind of fill fill in the blanks as they come. Uh, what were some of those major pieces? That, information or processes that you still carry today that you remember learning in that compliance job at Jacksonville? Were there like major learning moments that you're like, okay, that's, I'm going to put that in my pocket and carry that forward? Uh, one of the things I brought over was, um, you know, just talking about in initial eligibility, you know, and evaluating transcripts, high school transcripts for, um, you know, the core courses and, and those types of things. It's like we, at a compliance office with just limited personnel, we just don't have the resources to do that across the board for all the sports. So really we need coaches or assistant coaches to, to help process those too. And plus they're the ones that are recruiting that student. There's a, they're the ones that are building that relationship with that student and the family that if, you know, hey, you're going to be short core course or if your test score isn't going to meet the sliding scale, you know, we need to, you need to take the, retake the SAT or, you know, we need to make sure that you're, you're tracking on your core courses appropriately. And so it was important for coaches to learn, um, kind of the intric intricacies of that. And, um, I think that that was really successful in, um, not only their professional development, but them kind of taking accountability and ownership and who they're recruiting and, and then being able to speak to it themselves and not having to refer them to, you know, an academic counselor or, um, or a, a compliance administrator. Um, and, you know, so one of the other things that I brought over too um, were uh, the end of the season surveys. Uh, so it, I thought it was very important to make sure that we're um, evaluating and assessing the experience that our student athletes are having on an annual basis and not just senior exit interviews. So when I got here, senior exit interviews happened, but there was no sense of for the all of the student athletes, freshmen through seniors on that team, what the experience of that team was. And so I implemented that when I came here that, you know, at the end of every season, um, student athletes can do anonymous surveys to um, just let us know what their experience was, if there's any red flags, if there's, you know, any concerns, um, or if, you know, this is really great and I hope that we continue to do that. Um, so I, I think that those were um, some key things that I brought over. What would you say is... Now, obviously, a lot of things have changed, but what are some of the big things that change in the industry that really stick out to you? Um, well, like I had alluded to, um, you know, the APR um, really was a, a huge, um, uh, well, it's a huge report now um, that didn't exist before, like, 2005. And, um, but it was as a way to, you know, evaluate the health of a program through retention and eligibility of student athletes who are on athletics aid. So that really changed. And then I would say the most of the change is really recently. There's been such a, um, 
uh, de decentralization of um, and deregulation of the the rules. Um, so I, I think in more more is to come. I think there's going to be some major overhauls in financial aid, um, but just even with the transfer portal, and I think that there's more that's going to be coming down with um, with transfers, and then the entire you know name image likeness landscape um, that is. I mean, a, a stark departure from the amateurism rules that have been in place, you know, since I've been in this industry since the uh, early 90s, so, um, or late 90s. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's um, definitely, the landscape's changing uh, pretty, pretty quickly, even now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in every aspect, I mean, NIL, you have the conference realignments, you know, it's, it is for everybody, and it does have a trickle down effect for every department, regardless. Some for more, you know, some more. Um, being the SWA having that title as well, just give some context for people what that entails. Sure. So the uh, SWA, it's an uh, NCAA acronym. It stands for Senior Woman Administrator. And I think what's misconstrued about that is that it's not a title, but a designation. So the NCA requires every uh, school divisions one, two, or three to have an SWA. It's the same thing um, that they re so they require every school divisions one, two, and three to have a faculty athletics representative at FAR. Um, but it's a designation, uh, and the intent of it is to make sure that there is a female voice at the decision-making table. Um, in upper administration at every institution. So that was the intent of it um, when it was, um, you know, kind of set into, um, into motion. And um, at, at every institution, the underlying um, title and duties or responsibilities are different. So even within our conference, um, every um, day-to-day -day responsibilities vary. So we have some SWAs who are the business managers or the business operations and finance. Um, we've had in the past in our conference uh, an SWA that was um, oversaw facilities. Um, we, and, and at UNF, um, our SWA is involved heavily in compliance. And so that's uh, the majority of my function here is compliance and then most recently taking over the human resources function for the department. Um, so, but it varies from, from school to school just kind of based on the, the structure um, and the personnel at, at every school. So, yeah, so being a female in an upper administration, it's interesting because I talked with my sister about this. Remember I told you that she um, went to the Air Force. So. She actually went to the Air Force Academy and um, became a pilot, and she was the first female to ever, I think, drop bombs and active. Um, she was on a B-52 um, in war, so she was interviewed by USA Today, and she was all in, she's in textbooks even now. Um, and we talk about that, you know, being a female in male-dominated industries. It's like, can we both kind of ended up there? Um, she retired as a lieutenant colonel and was a squadron commander. And she asked, she was completely amazing. And um, but you know, we have a little bit of similarities in that, you know, most of the um, coworkers that we have are male. Uh, and um, but I don't. I mean, never really. I wouldn't say never bothered me or, or um, you know, gave me pause at all. I, it's like, hey, we all like the same things. We all like uh, sports and we all like um, the uh, opportunities that athletics gives to student athletes to have great experience. And um, so, I mean, I've never really, you know, um, thought that uh, I'm intimidated or I'm kind of out of my element at all. Um, but, I mean, I definitely would say, you know, to anybody that's kind of looking to get in the industry, you know, the internships are so important. And I think that you have a positive experience in an internship, regardless of whether you discover that, oh my gosh, that is exactly what I want to do and I found, you know, my niche. Um, or if you get in the internship and you're like, nope, this is not for me. E either one of those is a successful internship because you've 
found uh, you know the path to take one way or the other. Um, so I really highly encourage to get some kind of exposure you know into the industry just to see if it's something that you like and, and especially I would say that in, in the industry of compliance because you either like it and you have the skill set for it and um, it's something that clicks with you or it doesn't. Um, and you won't know that until you're really kind of been exposed through an internship or a grad assistantship or something like that. Um, but I do think it's important for, you know, um, student athletes um, to see, you know, women in those um, positions. And, um, and, and it's interesting because I, I, you know, think back in my middle school and my high school and I had mostly, for, for all of those years, mostly female PE coaches. And I didn't really think about it, you know. Um, but I think back and I had, oh, yeah, Coach Johnston. And I had um, my basketball coach was a female. And then Carrie Pruitt, who's at Middleburg High School, she, I think she's still coaching now, um, is uh, still there. And, uh, you know, I think back on it. And that probably subliminally, even though I didn't realize it at the time, maybe did have an impact on me to see somebody that looks like you that, you know, is a mom or experiences those things, um, you know, I think is really important. So, you know, and maybe it doesn't resonate with student athletes now that they see, you know, myself, they see Nancy, they see Caitlin, um, they see, you know, our um, uh, academic administrators and uh, they might not think of it now, but they can think back and it's like, wow, we had some really strong women that, you know, worked at, at UNF and um, I'm really, you know, maybe going to go for it, you know, mm -hmm. go for that, that, that next job opportunity mm -hmm. um, that resonates with them. Sure. I didn't ask this question, but what was that period, especially when your kids were young, trying to balance working athletics and having, <sighs> having to take care of kids? Wow. Uh, I, I think back on that and I really don't know how I did it. It was, uh, so I had, um, through, during those three years when I was a ticket manager, and at the time, JU um, uh, started sponsoring football, so in 1998, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know how I did it. I, I just remember my kids were toddlers at the time, and um, I remember bringing them to softball games and they would just kind of roll down the hill <laughs> that the berm or down the berm or whatever as, you know, games going on or bring them to baseball games and um, or, you know, they'd be with their dad um, or, or grandma. I mean, grandma was a big help, too. Um, I didn't bring them to everything all the time, but um, I, I really did have a, a great support system um, to make that happen. But, you know, it's interesting that... Um, my oldest daughter, you know, also went to FSU, so I kind of have a legacy there. Um, and she is uh, pursuing a career in the sports world, too. A little bit different, a little ironic. Um, she works for FanDuel, uh, helping people gamble on sports, <laughs> which is the irony of, you know, compliance administrator at a, a Division One college. Um, but, yeah, she um, got a... Um, a degree in uh, statistics and uh, is really interested in data analytics and so you know where's the best place to you know exercise those uh, types of skills but you know in a sports gambling setting uh, so uh, well FanDuel has the uh, fantasy sports side and then the sports betting side but so she's on the sports betting side trying to kind of get into using more for analytic skills there but um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, they're both now in their 20s and, you know, living their lives. And um, so along the way, I did something right because they're, they're both self-sufficient and, um, you know, making their way in the world as 20-somethings. So uh, um, yeah, it, but it, it was um, definitely challenging, but very rewarding. And so going back to that eighth grade, you know, I always wanted to be a mom. And so I, I kind of uh, feel like I got, a, a, you know, able to experience it, all of it. You know, I had the, the family, the career, and, you know, I, everyone's happy and healthy, so. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's <laughs> not lost on me. I'm, our coaches are female coaches that have young kids, a couple of them, Catherine and Christine. And it's just, you know, it's like, I don't know how you do it. So right. It's a, it's a lot, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, 
talk, yeah, I mean, those were some memories. Are there any other favorite kind of memories that you harken back on working in the field that really stand out to you? I mean, there's so many to choose from. Sure. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, One or two pop. Yeah. Well, I would say just in general, and this is, you know, from my days at JU, from my days at UNF, my favorite, my favorite night day, whatever you call it, of the year is uh, the end of the year awards mm -hmm. ceremony. I just, it just culminates with um, memories of great, you know, experiences. You know, we had all the highlights, the accolades, the just accomplishments. And I think it goes back to that living vicariously, right? Where um, it's just like, ah, oh, I'm such an awe of what they're able to achieve. And so we recognize not only what they do athletically, but what they've achieved academically. And it's like, oh my gosh, we just have, you know, such the triple threat with the, a lot of our student athletes who are also so engaged in the community and making an impact, you know, in the Jacksonville area. So um, that's just always um, been my, my favorite memories. Um, but, you know, as a compliance administrator, I also have those experiences of being able to relay just amazing news of, you know, your waiver was granted. It's like you're eligible, you're going to be able to play right away, and just student athletes running down the hall, just screaming, you know, just so excited. Um, so some of those victories just, you know, um, with NCA waivers, it was really memorable. And, um, but, you know, just recently, I would say, um, you know, as I've been able to, you know, in, in invest in programs as a sport administrator, um, you know, a couple years ago with women's tennis, that had been like one of my favorite. I, I, I was like on pins and needles um, in that first round of the NCAAs, and you can feel the momentum just shifting um, going down to that last court to where Annabelle was playing a freshman and it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to upset number 25 Ole Miss. Oh my gosh. And I was like running down the fence line because I was up watching. I was not on the court and I was running back and forth. And then um, I just remember talking to the Georgia Southern coach because they were getting ready to play the next match after us. And he was like, oh my gosh, this is a monumental upset. You have no, I mean, it, we were both just like in that moment of, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. And I just remember running, running on the court and just jumping up and down and just that, ah, uh, that elation. It's just, it, it was like no other, but it's just, but that's just like one. I mean, you could, the, the buzzer beaters, the walk-offs, the, you know, the epic finishes, you know, in a, a cross country race. I just, there's so many, um, that, uh, just really, you know, make you want to high five, you're smiling, you're just on cloud nine, and just experience that. It's really, really special. Yeah, the competition. I mean, yeah. It's, it's the best part, honestly. It's, you can't live without it for some people. And I know that's <laughs> a lot of the people that work in athletics would say that. Um, of course, being a Title IX based interview, just speaking um, kind of in culmination, how has Title IX impacted college athletics from your position? In, in, industry? Sure. Well, you know, specifically at UNF, um, we meet uh, Title IX. Um, there's three prongs to Title IX. Um, and we meet it through the pro proportionality prong. And so what that means is that the proportion of our student athlete participants is within two percentage points of the makeup of the general student population's um, gender makeup. So, and it's approximately 55% female to 45% uh, male. And so the general consensus is if you're within 2%, then you're meeting that standard. And so that's what we meet here at UNF um, since I've been here. And that is because it's strategic in the sports that we sponsor and that we offer uh, that really do um, reflect um, the interests and abilities of the, the um, student population that attend the UNF. So, um, Definitely would say, um, you know, that is, um, uh, you know, for our, our standard here, but 
Um, just in general, I would say Title IX really has just opened up the um, opportunities for female student athletes to play the sport that they love. Um, and not only that, but the um, availability of scholarships to pursue and uh, that render you know, grad or degrees that they go on to you know start their careers and um, and propel them into you know what they um, you know bring to their boardrooms and whatever careers that they are um, uh, pursuing. Um, but you know recently I would say just the equity equity of the broadcasts. You know, I think that the exposure that female sports are getting, whether it's through that ESPN3 platform, through the ESPN Plus platform, or whatever um, the uh, Facebook channels or YouTube channels or whatever, however schools are getting female sports out there, I think that it's really just opening up um, the, the general public into what fantastic what impressive athletes these women are and um, I think it's just only grown um, in interest and in popularity and I just think that it's we're just scratching the surface really think that um, and I think Title IX had a lot to do with that because it really does um, have athletics departments um, you know Set, I mean, set that up in, in that scope that, you know, we're, we're, we're broadcasting baseball games, we're going to be broadcasting softball games. I don't think that was always the mentality, you know, before, you know, in the 70s, if broadcasting was, you know, around back then um, in that sense. Um, whereas now it's just we're, we're always thinking that way. We're always thinking of um, what we're doing on the male side, we're going to provide on the female side. And, and that is um, a product of Title IX that, um, you know, is benefiting everybody. Because um, there's a lot of dads out there who have um, little girls and they're wanting to see, you know, their little girls and who grow up to, to be women playing for, you know, Division One sports or two or through whatever platform, you know, to get the exposure and um, the notoriety that they deserve for all the hard work that they do. Yeah, there's no doubt the most uh, activity on our Twitters are usually those parents and <laughs> tweeting right. and liking things and, right. and all that. Um, kind of a sidebar, too, you've been able to be in Jacksonville for such a long time and have that continuity here and work at JU and work here and then have that experience with the Jaguars and also see them kind of be a team um, from the ground up. Kind of what's what's it been like to view Jacksonville sport history from that kind of lens and how much has it changed? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, gosh, I remember... Gosh, I'm dating myself. I remember going to the Jacksonville Bulls games back in the old USFL, um, gosh, in the 80s. And, um, and gosh, yeah, it's, it's changed. It really has. Um, we, but having, a, being an NFL franchise city, I think, though, is n nothing's changed the city more, for sure. Um, and I really am hoping that, and I know that it will eventually get there, that that um, part of the having that franchise in the city is going to transform downtown, you know, to where, you know, we haven't yet. And uh, I think that that is kind of the next thing to come. But, um, yeah, I think that... There's been, you know, so much to, to offer, you know, here in, um, in Jacksonville. So we've had the Lizard Kings, ice hockey. Um, you know, we've always had the, the minor league um, baseball franchise and, and the Bregans. And uh, so it's, it's really um, been, you know, quite a transformation. Um, and even UNF is, you know, a, had their piece of that, you know, we, we've been um, 
NEIA to Division Two to Division One, and then you know building up a rivalry where we have a River City Rumble. Uh, so you know that um, is kind of a, a must-see matchup in across our sports that um, you know really also has you know brought some um, just interest in, into college sports uh, for the city. Yeah. Uh, Touched on a variety of things, but anything else that you want to share just in regards to your career, or Title IX, or uh, experiences or encouragement? Um, Actually, yes. I, I'm really interested, um, and I know we touched on just briefly the name, image, likeness. And, you know, my experience with just kind of rolling that out in, this, in its first year um, is that overwhelmingly our female student-athletes take advantage of that more than our male student-athletes. And I, I don't know if that's the case, um, you know, across other departments across the country, but I really do feel that NIL, um, you know, really could help propel um, female student athletes in ways that we've not been able to before, um, you know, for them to have that following and then to generate revenue from that and um, exposure and popularity. And so I really am interested to see where that goes and, um, you know, to what degree they can capitalize on it. Uh, and um, just really interested to see that, that unfold. Yeah, another chapter in the, your career and in college sports, no doubt. So, well, thanks for your perspective, Donna. It's great to get to talk in a little bit more depth.